Okay, good morning. Welcome, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I work in the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Sorry for the delayed start, um, but uh, glad that you guys can all be here with us today for an update on carbon pricing. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing today's event is we were looking over some of our programming and saw that we hadn't done an update on carbon pricing uh, in, uh, in uh, almost a year's time. Uh, and also that we were finding that there are more and more questions about not only what's going on internationally, uh, what's happening in China, what's happening in Europe, uh, how are uh, carbon markets progressing, what's happening in the private sector globally, how are people pricing carbon within their own business operations. Uh, and then also there's a lot of uh, discussion about state level, regional level activity in the U.S the potential for new carbon pricing uh, systems, but also the evolution of the carbon markets that we have. And so we thought it would be a great time to take a step back and look at where things stand, uh, where progress is being made, where things are somewhat frozen in time. And like everybody's favorite uh, romantic comedy, the extension of the will they, won't they federal discussion on will the US ever get a federally coordinated uh, carbon price? And is that even necessary? What are the trade-offs? What is the timing? What are the options? Uh, and we are just thrilled that we were able to get such an excellent panel of folks uh, together for this discussion today. Uh, joining us are John Larson, who's a director at the Rhodium Group, but also a senior associate here at CSIS. And he's going to talk to us about the U.S. Uh, and regional North American, uh, really, uh, carbon markets and uh, cap and trade schemes that we've got uh, here in the U.S. Uh, he's also going to do a little bit of just a you know background 101 on what are carbon markets and how are people pricing carbon. And then we're going to go to Tom Kerr with the IFC, who uh, is going to talk about both carbon markets uh, around the world and also how, uh, from the IFC's perspective, they see carbon pricing mattering uh, more and more to uh, companies and to the banks uh, and investors that they work with. And then fi finally, uh, Jerry Taylor, uh, who heads up the Niskanen Center, who does great work uh, and always uh, gives a really good overview of what's the status of the federal level conversation, how are the politics and uh, the mechanics of U.S. carbon pricing conversations going these days and give us a little bit of an outlook for that going forward. So we'll open it up for discussion. Today's uh, session is being webcast, and so I please ask you to silence your phones. Uh, and if there's an emergency, just uh, look to me and follow my red pumps as we run out the door together. No, um, uh, we will give you some direction on how to exit the building safely. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John and we'll get the conversation going. Thanks, Sarah, and it's great to be back at CSIS. Great to see everybody today. Thanks for coming out, and it's great to be part of such a great panel. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm going to start by just kind of very two minutes on what we're even talking about when we say carbon pricing, and then dive into the state of play at the uh, subnational um, level in North America. Um, so is this, I, there we go. Uh, so really quick, I'm uh, in my other my day job. I'm a director at Brodium Group. We do a lot of independent research and analysis on uh, disruptive global trends, and uh, I spoke spend most of my time on my favorite one, which is climate change. We do a lot of energy market analysis in the U.S. and globally, and uh, also consider uh, the impacts of climate change on on different uh, levels of the economy here in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, and I'm trying to make sure I get that hand off the screen. Let's. You told me not to push that button. It happens every time. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I feel bad. Um, uh, and you know, in in at Brodin, we think a lot about carbon pricing because it's it's always one of those policies everybody talks about as as being a important part of the puzzle when trying to craft a response to the challenge of climate change. Um, I think for the purposes of this conversation, I've been thinking about it as there's kind of two flavors. There's, there's cap and trade programs where you put a quantity limit on emissions from some activities in the economy, and then you let the market figure out what that, uh, those emissions are worth, right? So that your carbon price is actually solved through the, the market playing out and establishing what um, a dollar per ton would be or the emissions subject to that cap. The other flip side is you set a price on carbon through a carbon tax or some other fee structure, and then you let the economy figure out what level of emissions is going to respond, you know, equilibrate around that that price. Um, and you know, we're going to hear different levels of, of um, 
government activity here today on the rest of the panel. I'm going to now turn over to state uh, level and, and kind of sub-national uh, across North America activity. But we have, um, the, at least in the US, the predominant flavor of carbon pricing has been cap and trade where you've got um, two, different, two different existing programs in the United States. At the, um, you've got California's economy-wide cap-and-trade program, which is part of their broader AB32 greenhouse gas reduction program. They have a suite of other policies that are not carbon prices that also contribute to meeting their AB32 mandate, which is uh, getting back to 1990 levels by 2020, and then 40% below that by 24, uh, 2030. And then meanwhile, um, actually the longest active um, cap and trade program and carbon pricing program in the United States is actually in the Northeast, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which started up in 2009, uh, and is a cap and trade program on electric power center emissions um, from there. And then it's worth noting um, that uh, our friends to the north, most of the major provinces in Canada now have some sort of carbon pricing program of some effect. It's different different in different places, but Ontario, Ontario and Quebec uh, effectively have the, sec the same type of cap trade program as California, and uh, they are formally linked, which basically means Ontario and Quebec have their own programs, but you can use allowances from California for compliance with the uh, Ontario and Quebec programs and vice versa, which basically means those three jurisdictions all share the same carbon price. Um, Reggie is in the Northeast, it's effectively the same. You've got nine states with each with its own program, but then there's all this cross recognition, which allows for a single price across the, the market. And then meanwhile, in Western Canada, British Columbia has had a carbon tax on, I think, pretty much all fossil fuels for several years now. Um, it's somewhere in the order of $30 Canadian now per ton. Um, and Alberta is, is putting one in place for some, um, for most fossil fuel com consumption, not, not quite all. Um, and then not on the map, but worth noting is Mexico. Oh, actually, before we leave Canada, the federal government in Canada is now basically pr uh, crafting a backstop carbon pricing program. So uh, provinces that don't do enough, uh, either through an emission reduction commitment or um, a level of carbon tax, um, uh, the federal Canadian government will impose their own program on those provinces. So, so that's, that's coming. So basically all of Canada is going to be priced somehow in the near future. And then meanwhile in Mexico, uh, there's a cap and trade program uh, in the, I think just phasing into a mandatory stage this year, uh, which uh, at the federal level, which is also on major emitters, which is um, another uh, thing to note that we actually have maybe more carbon pricing um, around the US, um, both north and south than within. Um, but looking at recent action in the United States, um, while there's been California and the Reggie states for a while, uh, oops, I should have made sure that Maine was actually colored blue. Maine is part of Reggie. Apologies, Maine. Um, uh, and it's right on this map. But um, uh, there's been some movement in the past year, uh, you know, since the election and since the federal government's withdrawal to any serious climate policy discussion, um, there has been a look back to the states for inspiration and, and momentum and new action on, on climate policy. And uh, we've seen at least seven states considering carbon tax legislation um, over the past uh, year or so. And uh, in two of those places, in Washington, where there's been a push almost every year for several years now, including a, a ballot referendum. Um, they got about as far as they've ever gotten in the legislative process in getting a carbon uh, tax in place, but didn't quite get there. And then in Oregon, they were pushing a, um, basically, I, I don't think they framed it this way, but it's basically copy and, copying and pasting California's program into Oregon. Um, and again, that got as far as it's ever gotten legislatively, but still didn't get quite all the way over the finish line this legislative session. So look to both of those states as potential uh, points of activity next year um, or later this year. Then meanwhile, on the East Coast, um, with uh, Phil Murphy's election in New Jersey and Ralph Northam's uh, election in Virginia, uh, uh, Virginia is, is mo maintaining the momentum put in place by Terry McAuliffe to join, to basically create their own cap and trade program that is 100% compatible with Reggie. Um, and in New Jersey, um, which used to be a what used to be a member of Reggie, uh, pulled out at the end of 2011 um, under Governor Christie, they are now on track to rejoin the program. So you've got two um, new jurisdictions that will expand the Reggie 
footprint um, for electric power sector power, uh, carbon pricing from nine states to 11 states. Uh, I believe both states are on track to join by 2020. Um, the last thing I'll say, I'd be remiss to say it, is there's actually been substantial revisions to the existing carbon pricing programs in, in the US. So California um, extended its program to 2030 as part of its follow through on the 40% um, target and revised some of the market rules to um, increase the, the minimum price for carbon going forward, reducing the amount of uh, emissions offsets that can be allowed for compliance. So offsets are, are investments outside of a cap that achieve real reductions that can be used for compliance. And, uh, and also increasing the price ceiling, allowed, the maximum price allowed in California. So there, there's a lot um, of revisions that will, will enable the uh, occurrence of a higher carbon price in California down the road. And we'll talk about what those prices are currently in a minute. And then in Reggie, um, their program had been set to um, only go through about, I think, 2020 or 2021. And the states got together and did what was called their, I think, their second or third program review in which they uh, made some important revisions and set the cap out to 2030. Uh, they added um, an interesting new feature, which basically um, allows for if prices stay perpetually low for a considerable amount of time, the cap automatically gets tighter to try and bring those prices back up. That's, that's uh, I can go into the details much more if anybody's interested. Um, and so that's, that's uh, important in a, in a region where the carbon price has been relatively low um, over time. So there's a lot of new stuff that's been happening. Now, having said that, when you're thinking about the effectiveness of a carbon tax, you need to know two things. You need to know what's subject to the price and what the price is. Those two things matter for how much emission reduction you should be expecting to get from a program. So here uh, uh, at Brodeen, we have um, a pretty detailed 50-state data set of where all the emissions are in the United States. And we took a look at um, what's, what's subject to a carbon price in California and in Reggie. And um, you know, in total tons, uh, remember the US gross is about, we're in the six billion range as far as metric tons uh, nationally. California is about 344 million metric tons are subject to a carbon price uh, according in, in 2015 emissions. Uh, the current nine, Reggie, nine, Reggie states are about 70 million metric tons. They only cover the power sector. That's why the number is so low relative to California. And if we expand to include New Jersey and Virginia, we're up to about 117 in the expanded Reggie. That translates into about 75% of California emissions being subject to a carbon price. In Reggie, it's uh, currently only it's 15%. And then if you expand that to Virginia and New Jersey, it goes up to 17 because in particular, Virginia's power sector is relatively carbon intensive. Um, when you add that all up and ask, answer the question of how much of total US emissions are subject to a carbon price right now with subnational efforts, it's, um, it's 6% of total US emissions are have a carbon price attached to them. And if Virginia and New Jersey, or when Virginia and New Jersey join Reggie, it will be uh, 7%. So uh, if you look at coverage as a metric of success for, or, or at least uh, pervasiveness of a carbon price uh, in the United States, we're, we're still in single digit days. Um, and that could change through more states doing stuff or existing states extending their carbon pricing to new sectors and emissions, or federal action could happen. Those are basically your options. Um, looking at what the carbon price has been in these programs, uh, uh, in Reggie, and this is, I've, so Reggie is in short tons, and California is in metric, there's like lots of different unit issues here, so I made everything nice and simple. It's all the same metric, apples to apples in this chart here, uh, current dollar, uh, dollar per metric ton um, carbon prices. And Reggie, since it's been around since 2009, has had a price since then. California kicked in in 2012. And you can see in Reggie, we've had a very long period of very flat and very low carbon prices, somewhere around three bucks a metric ton. That rose as high as seven or eight dollars in, in uh, real terms per metric ton in 2015 and 16. That was not because of any market dynamic per se, like carbon, you know, price spike in gas or something like that. It was actually the prospect that Reggie might actually, in his last program review, tighten the cap. And everybody said, okay, this is gonna, this is gonna increase um, uh, the value of current allowances. Uh, once that all shook out, turned out that wasn't the case and prices went back down. Um, even with a significant tightening of the cap, it was not enough to really change the overall supply demand dynamic. And then in the meantime in California, um, we've been floating around the minimum price for allowances there, which is I think currently around 13 bucks a ton. Um, and 
Uh, again, there's been an uptick of late, and it's also, again, been because of program design. California just uh, reaffirmed and extended its cap and trade program out to 2030. It's going to get a lot more ambitious. Instead of just getting to 1990 levels, we're cutting those emissions by 40 percent over a decade, which is pretty serious. And uh, so the market is expecting the current allowance value to go up because you will have fewer, uh, fewer emissions permits to cover uh, uh, demand over time. Um, so, you know, but that's largely we've seen carbon prices in these markets responsive to policy as opposed to uh, other, other underlying fundamentals. Um, and to, to put a finer point on it, this is uh, historic and projected, rhodium projected reggie emissions uh, relative to the cap in reggie. And so in early days, and, and if anybody's followed the story of reggie at all, this, this, this isn't news. The, you know, uh, the states got together and set their ca cap at 2005 levels, kicked in in 2009, and turned out because of all the other trends of the power sector we all know and love, like cheap renewables, slack demand, and really cheap natural gas due to fracking, um, emissions dropped like, like crazy in Reggie, 50% uh, cut by 2015 from 2005 levels. And so, you know, it turns out the emissions cap that at the time was first in the nation, uh, leading um, leading the way, it turns out, was, was, was not binding at all, and that's why you had prices down around two or three bucks. Um, and then through subsequent program revisions, they've, as you can see through the black line, gotten much, much more stringent um, to try and soak up that surplus of allowances that happened early on. Um, and, and the most recent program revision, which is now in the implementation phase in the Reggie States, uh, is, is the cap you can see going out over time here. Um, this does not include the environmental containment reserve, so this mechanism I mentioned before where, where Reggie could soak up additional allowances and automatically tighten the cap, that's not in this chart. There's also some other like uh, BD, TBD um, tightening of the cap in the near term, some um, adjustments that the states have agreed to. So this doesn't reflect that, but at the moment we're seeing uh, and a projected emissions range that re and that range represents uh, the cost of renewables and the cost of gas. So, like you know, where emissions might go, given those uh, uncertainty around those variables, that uh, Reggie emissions are likely, with the current Reggie construct, going to be below the cap going forward. So, I I don't expect prices for carbon and Reggie to go up much, given uh, the current framework um, going into the future. Doesn't mean there aren't other important things that come along with Reggie, but that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, that could change both with these uh, adjustments I mentioned, but also uh, with bringing New Jersey and Virginia in, because they still haven't established what their caps are going to be. So on the left-hand side here is our cumulative emissions over the next decade, uh, uh, with um, the range being the, the, the two bars. So like if, if uh, um, we're on a high emissions end of the range, that's the blue bar. Low emissions is the green. And you can see uh, the tight cap on the Reggie uh, chart here is um, if those environmental containment mechanisms get fully utilized. So if the cap gets ratcheted down as much as it possibly could, um, uh, where would we be? And it's just important to note, if you want carbon prices to be above whatever the minimum price floor is, you need to have the bars here be higher than the dash line. You need emission, cumulative emissions to be higher than what the cap is, to put pressure on, uh, on uh, allowance demand. And you can see here we're either right on the line or right under it, depending on which way we want to be, uh, which way you believe renewables and gas prices are going to go, and um, how physically tight the cap could possibly get. So again, that's just reiterating the point I made before. But when you add New Jersey and Virginia, because their emissions are greater, you can see just the total size of these bars go a lot bigger. Um, but also, we don't know, New Jersey doesn't know what its cap is going to be yet. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty around whether or not Virginia, uh, Virginia and New Jersey might take on caps that might actually bind in their states, and then uh, which would make the regional cap tighter to some degree. So there's potential there for um, some potential, some changes and up, up, upside on allowance prices, but um, it's still early days, and those regulatory proceedings are underway now. So if you're curious about where Reggie's going, pay attention to Virginia and New Jersey. Um, the other thing on Reggie is that because unlike California, it's not, an, it's not covering all emissions. It's not covering emissions from buildings or transportation or industry. It's just power. Um, that trend I mentioned before, the good news that if electric power sector emissions in Reggie have gone down by 50 percent, that's all good news. But now the electric power sector is the third largest emitting sector in the Reggie region. Used to be the second. Transportation is, is uh, double the emissions of the power sector, and now buildings, uh, residential commercial buildings actually exceed the electric power sector. So if Reggie states want to do more 
to get at climate change, um, you either need other policies that focus on those other sectors, and there's um, a group of Northeast states through the Transportation Climate Initiative that have been weighing opportunities and, and uh, potential approaches in that space right now. That's conversations are underway. Or you can do, you know, other, uh, other policies around EV deployment or, or building codes, or there's any number of things. The carbon price is only one tool in the toolbox, but it is worth noting that um, it, it, the, the share of carbon priced emissions in Reggie is probably only gonna go down compared to everything else. Um, and then finally, uh, the last thing I was gonna close on is kind of where California's going. Um, California does use multiple tools in the toolbox to try and get at its AB32 commitments, not just the carbon pricing program. Um, however, in their latest scoping plan, which is required by law to say, okay, here's how we're going to get to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, um, they're taking a, a, an increasingly different approach to what they've done over the past decade in that they are putting much more weight on the role of carbon pricing in getting to that 40% target. So the blue line in this chart is where they think they'll go with all the other policies that California is pursuing. Renewable portfolio standards, energy efficiency, um, uh, the ZEV mandate for EVs, like any number of things. Uh, and that, uh, but that only gets you about maybe halfway to 40% um, by 2030. And, and you can see you're increasingly, uh, they're just gonna cross their fingers. The cap and trade is gonna close the gap. And um, you know, there's no reason to believe that won't happen. That's the way cap and trade is supposed to work. Um, but it does mean there will be probably even greater upside in allowance prices because uh, the more you rely on the cap and a price signal to get all the way, the rest of the way there, the more you're going to see prices go up, which is probably a good thing from setting expectations and driving more uh, innovation in in um, in California's economy. And it's going to, um, but it's going to be interesting to see uh, a departure from the the current experience of around you know thirteen fourteen dollar minimum carbon prices in California. So watch for that. That's going to be, I think, an interesting thing that a lot of people are keeping an eye on. And um, with that, I'm going to stop and turn it, turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Sean. I'm going to hold my questions just so we can go through the presentations and we'll have a discussion at the end. So Tom, you're up next. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Jeff, for that. And thanks, Sarah, for inviting me. It's uh, great to be back here after a little uh, hiatus. Uh, um, as you said, I work at the World Bank Group. I work at the IFC, which is the private sector side of the World Bank. But um, for the past five years or so, I've been driving a sort of carbon pricing uh, movement, if you will, amongst companies and, and, and governments around the world. And so Sarah asked me just to give you a quick snapshot of what's happening and in, in addition to what's happening in the U.S. Uh, and what I was going to do is just give you some facts and figures about what's happening. Uh, there's some general good momentum, good news, with this very sobering punchline, uh, then, and then conclude with some ideas of how we might address that, that punchline. So, um, so I'm actually going backwards. That's not good. Sorry. OK, so this is um, the state and trends of carbon pricing. If you're interested in this topic, you should, be, you should know about this. Um, it's kind of cut up at the bottom there. There's a website, though. A nifty new tool has been developed by the World Bank called the Carbon Pricing Dashboard, which allows you to go in and click on a jurisdiction. You can see the price levels, the coverage, which sectors, uh, the trends over time. And you can even collect data and, and manipulate it yourself. So if you really want to now analyze a particular region or sector, you can do that. So that's been online. They, this state and trends report's been coming out for several years. But I think about a year ago, they made it interactive and, and usable like that. So. Um, I would like just to give you a couple quick statistics from this, and actually this um, report just came out, the latest version, the, the update just came out about a month ago. Uh, and so um, I think, so globally, we're at 42 national jurisdictions have some sort of pricing program in place, 25 sub-national. Um, it's about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions have a price applied to them in some way. And interestingly, uh, each year these are generating about $50 billion in value, uh, so revenues from taxes or revenues from auctions and things like that. Um, 81 of the nationally determined contributions in Paris, the Paris pledges, reference carbon pricing as part of a, you know, a key part of, the, of this, the country's solution to achieve their climate target. Uh, so that's all good, very good news, and I think on the, also on the value, so we project that uh, today it's 50 billion in value, but it should get up to 100 billion in value by 2020. 
So I think someone who myself has been following climate for many, many years, uh, the 100 billion question always comes up uh, around the context of the Green Climate Fund. And I think it's fascinating to sort of see that, you know, carbon pricing initiatives at the domestic or subnational level are actually getting, finally going to get to that level when we have been able to come anywhere near that in terms of sort of donor pledges for, for climate action. So. Uh, just park that for a minute. We can talk uh, more about that later. I'm, I'm, I think the use of revenues is a very key uh, political tool that we need to, to take more advantage of. Um, this is just a quick update of the new initiatives we've seen. And so, as I said, we, we you know, at the World Bank, we have client countries, uh, mostly ministers of, of, of the finance, but also at the ISC, we have private sector clients. And so, We've started to see an uptick in countries coming to us, especially at the finance ministry, saying, "Hey, tell us, tell me about carbon pricing. I'm kind of interested in this. Um, you know, is it how, how much revenue might we generate? What are the sort of options for fiscal policy you might say for climate?" Uh, so here you see, you know, different in initiatives going forward. To me, the more interesting ones are. I mean, obviously you have um, the ones in North America, but Chile, Colombia. Uh, and South Africa. South Africa and the new administration has now reaffirmed its commitment to do a carbon tax, which had kind of been dying on the vine for a few years. Uh, so that's a really interesting uh, new development. I think the proposal before was about $8 a ton. Um, and then Argentina, as the G20 presidency, just announced about six months ago that they wanted to put in place a $25 a ton carbon tax. Uh, we had a big ministerial during spring meetings a few weeks ago, and we had the Minister of Finance from, from Colombia. They've had the carbon tax in place. It's only $5 a ton. Um, but he was, the first thing he said is it generated $150 million last year. Um, and that's, I mean, I'd like to see that grow. Uh, so I think that's the kind of mindset we, uh, we're seeing is, is more, more attention being paid to this as a, as a fiscal uh, sort of tool. Uh, so uh, there's a, a lot of uh, action in the Americas, as we said, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's a positive government picture. Um, as I said, we also track the corporate side. So I don't know if you're familiar with the CDP. It used to be called the Carbon Disclosure Project. For the past few years, they've been tracking the disclosure by major companies about the use of an internal carbon price. So this is a tool that they use internally. They assess a price to an investment decision. Uh, they sort of stress test it, and they decide, you know, hopefully this is a way to steer them toward a company towards a lower carbon footprint, a more efficient business model. Fascinating stories from, you know, Microsoft to all the way to Unilever, to Mahindra Group in India, to a guarantee bank in Turkey. You know, we, we're hearing many more companies doing this. And, the, and I've been tracking this since the beginning. Um, about four years ago, it was about 100 companies. Now, last year, it was 1,500 companies have said that they're, they have a price in place or they plan to do it in the next two years. The largest growth has been in Asia because they saw the Chinese carbon market coming. They saw um, Korea has a cap and trade. Uh, Singapore has now introduced a carbon tax. And so they kind of see the writing on the wall. And most of the companies, our clients uh, at IFC are saying, you know, help me get ready for this future. Get, help me sort of stress test my business model. How do I use this as a tool to reallocate capital and to make smart business decisions? So I think that's a great, uh, a great new development. Um, then uh, just to g give you a highlight on regional increase, this just shows you as well uh, the Asia story. I mean, Europe had been leading, uh, but you can see that growth from you know very little, very few companies doing this to many, many com uh, companies, hundreds of companies now. Uh, so if you're a consultant in the room, I would suggest you co uh, contact these companies because uh, I get many, many calls from them sort of, how do I do this? What's an internal carbon price? Walk me through it. Uh, so I think there's a huge business model through there as well. So, I, so that all sounds fantastic. I mean, you're probably thinking, wow, this is much more optimistic than I thought. So I guess the punchline I was saving for is so the average price level of the 15% of, of, of emissions that are priced around the world, uh, there, it ranges from a dollar a ton to $140 a ton in the Nordic countries, uh, and the average price is under $10 a ton. So I think that's the price, that's sort of the punchline that it's great to see these emissions priced, but are they really making you know, changes in behavior and, and shifting as rapidly as we want to a low carbon business model? And, and the answer is no. But I think the, so that's what we really have to do. And so we had this big meeting I mentioned uh, at the bank last week, um, had CEOs and finance ministers around the table talking about this topic. Uh, and we've come out with sort of a lexicon that, you know, it's, it's a bit, bit, you know, something you can remember. Uh, we wanted to, to, you know, keep it simple uh, for these folks. But uh, so deepen, expand, and link. 
so we wanted to deepen carbon price levels, I guess that's, or raise carbon price levels is to deepen the, the, the impact. Um, and so this is, uh, we mentioned, uh, John mentioned Canada, the carbon price floor. Um, we think that's a great new direction of travel. Yeah, if you haven't paid attention, they, there are many of the provinces had prices uh, at different levels and ca the federal government came along and said, we're going to int introduce a $50 a ton price floor by 2022. Uh, if you're not at that level, we're going to make you at that level. So that's a, that's a strong sort of uh, shoring up of, the, of their carbon price plan. In the EU, we've seen the same, uh, same proposals being introduced. France and the Dutch have been the most vocal on this. I think the French proposal was 25 to 30 euros uh, per ton of CO2 uh, price floor as well. And so these are, you know, these are the sorts of deepening we want to see. Uh, and I think, as we mentioned, I mentioned the Colombian finance minister was saying that now we've introduced this and we're going to give it a sort of slowly rising price over time and then let business sort of plan. But then we, we like the, the revenue generation model this produces for us. Um, and then the second one is expand. So I think we want to see obviously more jurisdictions expand, more sectors being covered. Um, <clears throat> so we have a lot of work at the World Bank. Um, working with countries on, their, on these nationally determined contributions. Uh, we have something called the Partnership for Market Readiness um, that helps countries to put in place carbon pricing programs. Also the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition is sort of the political dialogue. And so we need to see more jurisdictions looking at this, figuring, learning from others. Uh, you know, there's been this explosion of interest and I think there are best practices emerging on how you do this and how you don't do it. Uh, so we need to expand. Uh, and then the final thing is linking. I think we want to start to see systems link and we, we have the California and Ontario, Quebec linkage happening. But the interesting thing here is we are seeing a discussion around the Americas. Uh, there was a carbon pricing of the Americas initiative announced, uh, uh, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, and, and Mexico, and, and Canada and California are talking about, you know, eventually can we get to a longer term carbon pricing market across the, the two continents. Uh, also the Asia Society Policy Institute in, in Asia, uh, Kevin Rudd, the former Australian Prime Minister, is, is spearheading something with China, Korea, and Japan uh, about a, a sort of a regional carbon market there building on what they've been doing. So we'd like to see more of that. Uh, the World Bank has something called the Network Carbon Markets Initiative that's helping at the technical level on that. So the final thing I want to leave you with is, I guess, coming back to what I do at IFC, is that I really think business can help. Um, the, the, mo the most interesting thing uh, I've seen in the past three or four years in this space has been, the, as I said, you see these price levels, the internal carbon pricing. Um, we also are seeing uh, companies, I, I think what's happening with that, that trend, companies are giving the political space for the government to move. If, if they start to set internal carbon prices higher than the regulated price levels, and they're sort of getting ready for this, and then, and then they start to say more and more, we actually want you to price our carbon, but we want to tell you how we, we'd like it to be done. You want to have a conversation about that. I think that's a really ripe space for, uh, for some conversation. So um, one really interesting uh, example, or uh, actually three jurisdictions we've seen um, groups of major companies coming together to simulate cap and trade uh, before they're regulated. So the, in Brazil, uh, over 20 companies, including like Vale, Rio Tinto, uh, Banco Itau, um, are working with the stock exchange to set a cap and then simulate trading and see what the price levels they discover. They, they then issued a communique to the Brazilian government, who has not talked at all about a carbon price, that we really want you to do this, and here's what we've learned. Uh, Mexico is also doing a, a simulation, and they're just about to introduce a, a, a new carbon market uh, proposal uh, before the election, I understand. Uh, and then India uh, is also, we're just gearing up to do a simulation in India with some of the Tata, Mahindra, and some of the bigger companies there. So again, that's, that's one really interesting development. Um, I think the other final thing I'll say is, is a sectoral uh, play. So um, for, we are a financial institution as, as the World Bank Group. Um, there has been a real strong movement. I don't know if you've been watching this um, task force on climate-related disclosure. Mark Carney and, and uh, Michael Bloomberg introduced this at the Paris COP, um, where banks and, and corporates are supposed to stress test their footprints against future climate risks of all sorts. It could be impact risk from storms. It could be carbon prices. It could be uh, lawsuits. Um, many other ways. And so here, uh, as uh, financial institutions are, are, are moving now to do internal carbon pricing over their investment decisions. So they're starting to ask, well, this is a pretty high emitting asset. What if, if, we, if they have to absorb a $30 a ton price, which look, is starting to look likely in some jurisdictions, is this still a viable investment we would make? And in some cases, they're, they're steering away from those investments. So that's a very interesting development. 
I don't know if you've been watching the maritime space. Uh, we've been working closely with the uh, IMO and, and uh, various maritime players uh, about doing carbon pricing in that sector. And there's been some proposals generated if you're interested to learn more about that. And then finally, very interesting, it just got started with the construction value chain. Uh, so we have Lafarge, Holcim, and Semex, and some of the big cement manufacturers. We have Roussel, uh, uh, some of the big metal manufacturers, all the way down to real estate and construction operators saying, What's the role of carbon pricing in shifting investments uh, down the value chain? We can't just do it ourselves. And so, you know, how do we do that? So I, I think there's a lot of space here. And I'll leave you with the point I mentioned about use of revenues. I think if you can, you know, the biggest concerns businesses are going to have is about competitiveness and the phasing in of this sort of price. But if they have a say at the table and they can talk about Here's the, way that, you know, here's the ideas we have for the use of revenues. Here are the ideas around how you might design this. I think we're seeing that, that sort of a fruitful space for conversation in a lot of the countries we operate in. Uh, and I can only hope it might come back to this country at some point. So thank you. Uh, so on that last point, about whether it'll come back to this country at some point, uh, Jerry, you can either speak from up there or here or wherever. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's a delight to be here. Thanks for inviting me to partake in the discussion. I apologize for not having a PowerPoint to, to offer to you today. I believe the power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So <laughs> I try to avoid it, though John and Tom remained remarkably uncorrupted in their remarks, so I might need to rethink that. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit to wrap up this conversation before we throw it to Q&A about the prospects for carbon pricing in the United States. And to have that conversation, we really want to talk about the prospects for carbon pricing in the Republican Party, because it's the Republican Party that's been the main obstacle to federal climate action, broadly speaking, and to carbon pricing in particular. Uh, were it not for Republican opposition, we would be having a different conversation this morning. So it's important to focus on that, particularly since uh, uh, most political scientists who look at congressional action are rather skeptical of the idea that one party will win such total victories across the board that it can move its agenda against all opposition. Now, of course, we're used to seeing parties try that sort of thing. But uh, Professor Francis Lee at the University of Maryland, just up the road, probably the foremost scholar in this area, looked at all significant legislative, priority legislative uh, 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 action items from the early 1990s to the present. And she asked the question, how many priority pieces of legislation were passed and signed into law without the majority support of the minority party in Congress over the course of the last several decades? And she found the answer was about 5%. And it only occurred when all three branches of government were controlled by one party. Uh, and those uh, victories did not necessarily prove particularly stable. In other words, they became bloody shirt items that were not necessarily uh, well anchored in the law. So a great example of that is the Affordable Care Act, uh, which was passed in exactly that manner. Uh, only through Republican incompetence did it survive uh, in the last year. So the point is, it can happen without any Republican movement, but it's sort of like what, what, hoping for a political lottery ticket to come in, and that's probably not a very good strategy. So if we want to look towards how we might see carbon pricing in the United States, what we really need to do is look towards how can the Republican Party uh, be expected to embrace this and what are the prospects for it. Now, it might be uh, at that point we stop the conversation because if you've been paying much attention uh, over the last several years, norms of tribal identity in the GOP have almost required uh, every last member of the GOP to argue that climate change is a hoax, that it's a, a product of uh, corrupt science, uh, that it is a plot to destroy American manufacturing or produce one world government uh, or uh, something of that nature, and that Climate change doesn't really exist anyway. It's cicadas or something like that. Uh, but the reality is, and the, if, if you take a deeper look at the GOP, and I've spent my whole life pretty much in it. I spent 20 odd years at the Cato Institute on the other side of this debate, by the way. Uh, and we continue to work pretty closely with the, uh, with the GOP at the Niskanen Center, which uh, I founded a few years ago. Uh, a close look suggests that there are reasons for real optimism, uh, and a few of those. First of all, the coal industry is not long for this world. One of the strongest 
coalition members in the Republican Party which demands uh, opposition to climate action is the coal sector. Uh, and they just will not be here for much longer. They are a dying industry. They're facing a hard landing in the market. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that the Trump administration uh, can do about that. Uh, there is virtually no combination of leg regulatory or legislative action that is conceivable that will save the coal sector from the marketplace itself. And as coal fades, uh, one major demander for climate denialism in the GOP disappears. The second uh, encouraging thought is that the uh, uh, so-called big oil, uh, which uh, a decade ago or two decades ago had been very vigorously fighting climate action has now through some, some degree of uh, thrown the white flag on the issue and stood down uh, towards moving towards active promotion of carbon pricing as a federal policy response. Uh, and that's a major change as well. Uh, in other words, without the biggest players in the fossil fuel industry, uh, opposing climate action down the road, or at least imposing carbon pricing, uh, things look a little bit sunnier in the Republican Party, simply because if there's one common denominator about the Republican Party, it's been a lot of things over its, uh, uh, over its long life, but it's always been the party of business. And these particular businesses in the fossil fuel industry have always had privileged positions in the GOP. Uh, a third uh, related uh, encouraging sign is the rise of the renewable energy industry, and a lot of that renewable energy industry is rising in Republican states, as you know, not all of it, uh, but uh, the Midwest and the Southeast, uh, excuse me, the Southwest and other red states are also states which are seeing uh, incredible growth in renewable energy. And as we see the market produce more and more of these competitive fuels, you're going to see stronger and stronger business coalitions promoting them. And if the renewable energy industry plays its cards smartly, uh, it will not necessarily migrate into the Democratic Party, particularly since a lot of wind energy is produced in red states. And we do see red governors who normally are fairly conservative, like Sam Brownback in Kansas, supporting wind energy preferences and things of that nature. Uh, as that continues to play out, uh, there will be a active constituency in the business community within the Republican Party pressing uh, for carbon pricing, and that will be a good thing. Uh, a fourth positive trend is the rise of the millennial vote. Uh, the danger for the Republican Party, broadly speaking, is that uh, if they do not course adjust, they run the risk of looking like the California uh, Republican Party in that they were able to win with these sorts of uh, political narratives about immigration and, uh, and uh, socio-cultural issues only for so long. And uh, with the more and more millennials voting, what we do know is that millennials care a lot more about climate change than other generations. It's in their top three or four issue priorities. In other words, the biggest problem we've always had in the climate arena is that it's not a very salient issue. But it is for millennials. It is an extremely salient issue, and it's a branding issue. And in fact, uh, people we know in the Republican Party in California tell us through internal polling that one of the biggest problems they have in California with drawing, attend drawing voters into the GOP is their position on climate. It's just toxic. It is a conversation stopper. And if the party can, goes down that road, and I think we can see it going down that road as we speak, the GOP will have a strong incentive to pivot on climate. Even just as a signaling matter uh, for the new voters which are now beginning to dominate the field. And fifth, there is a declining salience of the old laissez-faire, limited government, hands-off creed in the Republican Party. Uh, as you've probably noticed, the GOP has now become the party of the white working class. In a way, it is an exact mirror image of the Democratic Party of 1896 and William Jennings Bryant. Uh, it's not all that different looking than the Democratic Party under Franklin Delano Roosevelt as far as what its base looks like. And you can see that when you've got a base like that, it's no longer country club Republicans. You're talking about Roseanne Barr styled voters talking endlessly about cutting corporate, income, corporate taxes and deregulation and all that leaves them cold. And even Donald Trump knows it leaves them cold. When he goes on the campaign trail, right, he says, this is all boring. He throws a speech aside and starts talking race or, or nationalism or trade or something like that. He knows what motivates his voters. And it is not the sort of political narratives that come out of Wichita, Kansas, and Coke Industries. Under those circumstances, how much longer can the Republican Party expect to hold its base and motivate them to turn out by offering narratives that say big corporations and fossil fuel industries get to put the planet at, planet at risk and impose costs on you uh, because, well, they just make a lot of profit that way and that's a really good thing.
I, I think in the long run, that's not a sustainable political situation. It doesn't necessarily require climate action, but it, it, it reduces the opposition to climate action the Republican Party with the change of the base. Let me wrap up with a few uh, translations of where these uh, positive trends of the GOP may take us. Uh, because ultimately what we want to talk about are windows of opportunity. And uh, uh, proponents of carbon pricing uh, can't force political windows open. We don't have that kind of ability. The best we can do is take advantage of political windows when they open uh, and move forward. Uh, and that's one of the biggest tasks we have, is to make sure that we have well-crafted ideas, that we have uh, created a center of gravity around these ideas, that they are the preferential uh, responses uh, with our uh, political constituencies, so that when opportunities arise, we can exploit them well. I count eight windows of opportunity in the not entirely too distant future, and there's probably more. Uh, the first is infrastructure. Uh, it's probably not going to happen in this particular Congress, but the reality is, is that a real meaningful infrastructure program from the federal government will cost at least a trillion dollars, all told, uh, and the appetite for blowing the debt even beyond where it is at present is minimal. Uh, it's not non-existent. Uh, we have yet to find out how far Congress will go in blasting the debt. Uh, so I hesitate to say anything too dramatic about it. But from what I understand on the Hill, uh, the appetite is nearly sated. Now, if we're going to have a meaningful infrastructure program at a trillion dollars or more, there's only so many places you can get that revenue. Uh, and while a carbon tax is not an attractive uh, revenue raiser, a VAT's even less attractive. There are other things which are also uh, uh, difficult lifts on that front. So one could imagine carbon taxation as a means of paying for infrastructure, particularly if Donald Trump finds that he needs a win somewhere before uh, 2020's general election. Uh, it looks like he will have none others, no other opportunity unless he decides to fold here. So that'd be one possibility. Uh, a, second is, uh, a second window of opportunity might be produced by what's going on at the Climate Leadership Council. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, this is an organization uh, established by James Baker and George Schultz. Uh, it was put together by Ted Halstead, who founded New America, and it's a membership organization of sorts of uh, major fossil fuel companies, primarily big oil companies, working at what a legislative architecture for a carbon tax might look like and how it might be moved within the Republican Party. I hesitate to make any strong predictions about where that may play out, but if indeed the, oil, the big oil industry can move from its generalized statements for carbon pricing towards agreement about some broad architectural details, that could then force the conversation. If the oil industry decided to actively engage and promote carbon pricing in the GOP, which they are not doing at present, that might provide a window of opportunity as well, since it would be very difficult for oil state Republicans, who tend to be pretty deep red, to have a major fight with their biggest industry. Uh, third, there's a possibility of Trump triangulation. If the Democrats take the House and the Senate, one thing we know is that Donald Trump likes to win. He does not like to lose. And we also know he doesn't particularly care what's in the legislation as long as it's a winner and that he gets to sign it and that he's given credit. One could imagine in a world, I would not put money on this prospect, but the prospects are not zero, that in a world in which the Democrats control the House and the Senate, uh, there will be very good reason for Donald Trump to find ways that he can then claim credit for moving Democrats. And in this particular arena, if carbon pricing could be used, to, with the revenues from carbon pricing used in a way to give coal a soft landing and to find some support in the industry for that, which I think is quite possible, though it's not on the uh, radar screen at the moment, under those circumstances, I could imagine a, uh, a window opening. But these are kind of low probability prospects, after all. I, don't, I wouldn't want to get too chesty. The real windows of opportunity look promising open after, nine, after the general elections in 2020, presuming that a Democrat wins the White House. Uh, under those circumstances, things become a lot rosier, and that's uh, not exactly an unlikely scenario, even though I wouldn't call it a certainty. Uh, the fourth window under those circumstances is budget reconciliation. Uh, this is the one area where the Democratic lottery ticket may very well come in. One could imagine right out of the gate in 2021, with the Democrats control the House and the Senate of the White House, they will go back and take a bite out of the tax, uh, tax reform apple that the De Republicans just bid into. And one could imagine a carbon tax as part of budget reconciliation, which would get away from the need of, uh, of away from the ability of, Demo of Republicans to filibuster in the Senate. Uh, and with a carbon tax and budget reconciliation, you open up a lot of opportunities in tax reform. So if a Democratic president wanted to invest capital uh, 
in a carbon tax. And, and that Democratic president had both chambers. I could certainly imagine carbon pricing blitzkrieging through the, uh, through the Congress. Uh, I'm not sure I'd predict all of that. If Joe Biden's the president at that time, I'm not sure Joe Biden would invest his political capital in it. But I could imagine other Democrats doing it as well. Uh, another window of opportunity uh, under a Democratic administration is a sticks and carrots approach. Assume for a minute that Michael Gerard or Bill McKibben is running EPA. And, they decide, and this EPA administrator decides to use every last statute he possibly or she possibly can to uh, make up for lost time and to decarbonize the economy on a fast pace. With the Democratic president then making an offer, we can go this route along with a whole package of keep it in the ground legislation and mandates on Detroit for EVs in the same fashion that Europe and China has now gone into, or we can have a carbon pricing exercise. Let's have this conversation one last time. This is essentially well, more or less what the Democrats put on the table uh, uh, in the conversation for uh, cap and trade with Wax and Markey. The Republicans walked away from that uh, perspective deal at the time. I'm not sure they'd walk away from it under, these, or under those circumstances at all. One could imagine a deal. A sixth window of opportunity are the uh, city lawsuits. As you know, as many of you might know, the cities of New York, uh, Oakland, San Francisco, now Boulder, plus a number of counties in California uh, have, uh, have uh, put forward state common law actions against the oil industry seeking for compensation for climate damages that have been caused uh, uh, that they're having to uh, pay for in the course of climate change. I believe, while some, it's very, you find many different opinions about the merits of these suits, uh, I think there's some real promise here. And if indeed these suits get legs, one could imagine the oil industry going to Washington looking for liability protection. They have a Republican Congress. They can probably get it, uh, but not necessarily so easily, particularly if the Democrats take the House in November. Uh, one could imagine uh, liability protection being given the industry. One could imagine industry being very highly motivated to get it because you, if the industry loses even one time in the face of all of these suits, uh, that's the end of the road because the, the uh, liability uh, uh, figures are so, so high for the industry it would be crippling. Well, under a settlement deal with liabilities put on the table, carbon pricing would be a natural pairing. So I could imagine a window of opportunity occurring if these climate uh, liability suits uh, get uh, uh, get traction. Seventh window is a GOP pivot. If the Republicans get blasted into the Stone Age politically after the 2020 generals, uh, they will be looking uh, at the same picture the California Republican Party looked. And as I mentioned before, one could imagine a GOP that decides to rebrand itself uh, and move strongly on this front and signal that rebranding with an embrace of climate price, uh, carbon pricing. Now, this might seem a little far because it's so hard to imagine a world in which the Republicans move on this, given how uh, full throat they are in climate denialism. But you do remember that for eight years, up until this last general election, the Republican Party waved the bloody shirt of health care and Obamacare uh, and endlessly. If there was one thing that defined the Republican Party was against health care socialism, creeping communism, the European state coming through the back door of health care. Uh, it was the fighting creed of the Republican Party. And then when Donald Trump announced for the presidency in uh, the spring of 2015, uh, for at least four or five months, uh, he was defending federal health care policy, not necessarily Obamacare, but he was opposing, you know, the idea of laissez-faire health care, and he was embracing single payer. It did, it, it did not cost him a bit. Remember, he's got a white working class Republican base now. So if the Republican Party can put us, can pivot, pivot so quickly on an issue like health care, believe me, on a much lower saliency issue like climate change, it can pivot as well. Uh, an eighth and final window that I see is the debt deficit issue. Periodically in American politics, we go through debt and deficit panics. We saw it with Ross Perot in 1992. We now have uh, uh, projected debt levels that are going to dwarf those down the road. And one could imagine another occurrence of a deficit debt crisis or at least political panic occurring. And there is absolutely no way there are, is an anywhere near enough political opportunity to cut spending to make up for that debt. Uh, that is required. There would have to be massive tax increases to take care of this problem now, thanks to the amount of debt we've piled up on, the, uh, on future generations. And of all of the means by which we can raise that revenue, a carbon tax is probably the least painful of the many alternatives. Uh, and there's probably other windows. I mean, one thing that we cannot do in American politics is predict when windows are going to open or what those windows are going to open, uh, or what they're going to look like. After all, a major storm, uh, a, a major uh, increase in, uh, in temperature, which 
which be, makes things more undeniable. It's just very difficult to say. Uh, but in any of those circumstances, I think we have plenty of opportunities to bite at the apple, but we need to be prepared to do so, and we need to be prepared to talk uh, and think seriously about building Republican support to the extent to which we can for these things, because as stated before, the idea that this is going to be unilaterally imposed by Democratic majorities, which will hold until the end of time, I think is a rather implausible proposition. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. Okay, so uh, we've got about 15 to 20 minutes because Tom does have a little bit of an early departure uh, that we need to get to. So I'm going to ask that we keep both questions and responses as, uh, as succinct as possible. And we're going to move to the audience question period relatively quickly. I did want to ask one question of each of you, but they should be relatively easy, uh, easy ones to hit. Actually, Jerry, maybe not for you, but we'll see. Um, John. Uh, do the fact that uh, subnational carbon markets stay around their floor uh, mean that they don't work? Uh, no, they do work. I mean, there, there's and there's two reasons why. One is there there is still a positive carbon price, right? There is still some sort of market signal that carbon costs something, and you should plan around it. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how much of an impact is that signal directly having? And at two bucks, three bucks a ton, it's probably not much, but it's something, right? So that's one thing. But I I do think. Other energy market factors, like cheap gas, for example, in Reggie, uh, have a bigger impact than the carbon price. That's one side. The other side that we didn't talk about all that much, uh, Jerry touched on it, is when you have a carbon price, you generate revenue. Uh, yeah, and Tom mentioned it too. And and in Reggie, uh, while you know three bucks a ton doesn't get you a lot, it gets you enough to matter. So a lot of energy efficiency programs and uh, repair relief programs and renewable energy deployment programs in the Reggie region are all funded almost exclusively through Reggie. And uh, in the past, it's totaled you know, more than a couple billion dollars in revenue generated since 2009. And so that, that funds other shifts in the energy markets that would not have happened without, without that input. Awesome. Tom, um, I'm toying between two questions, but they're both kind of easy, the, uh, not easy, but quick. Um, you talked a little bit about how companies are sort of evolving their strategies uh, on carbon pricing, because there's two, there's two real issues here on carbon pricing, right? One is you just get one in place, and two is sort of perfect it over time, right? Um, do, do you have an overall sense of how much uh, pressure or progress on the carbon pricing side in the private sector is influencing sort of the decision making, not only about like, should we have a carbon price at from a government perspective, but like the adequacy of the approach to that, right? I mean, is the private sector raising the game for uh, uh, for governments? I think the yeah. I mean, I think definitely it is uh, the the what it is. As I mentioned earlier, is it's giving that sort of political space to move. I think that the fact that um, the, you know that I've seen a lot of the the ministries we're talking with, they'll they'll notice that. You know, some of the reported internal carbon prices are, you know, $50, $80 a ton. Uh, and they were talking about a $5 ton. They're saying, okay, we're in a safe zone here. And so this gives us room to maneuver. Um, and I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of companies, uh, I mentioned the Brazil, uh, Mexico, and India examples. Um, that, and I know in California before they did the cap and trade, PG&E and several uh, participants in the market did a simulation as well. And I think that sort of really focused experiment with some major name companies. Uh, and then they feed back, here are the design lessons we learned, and here's how we want you to, you know, here's some input. I think that it creates a much more positive feedback uh, between the two. Um, so I think that that's the case. And then also, in, I didn't mention Canada, um, about 25 companies had joined this carbon pricing coalition, and they released a report uh, just uh, in, in April or, or in, in the end of March. Um, it was sort of, it, it was one of the best pa pa papers I've seen at sort of what's the business case for carbon pricing. You know, we're in a major uh, fossil com economy, but yet we still, and there was TransCanada, Enbridge, uh, those companies, uh, Air Canada signed up to this, um, basically saying, here's what carbon pricing is, uh, here's why we think it's important important and here's wh where we want to engage with government to design going forward. And I think you're going to see more, more jurisdictions, more companies uh, following that sort of model to, you know, let's have a conversation about this. We, we want to see it happen, but we want to also be at the table rather than, you know, not involved as, as you design it. And Jerry, you had, a, you had answered my question about whether or not companies can create opportunities for a, a dialogue here or, or create those windows uh, for carbon pricing at the federal level here in the U.S. 
But what I want to ask you is on the Democratic side, are you have a lot of scenarios that sort of assume a lot of coherence on the Democratic side. Yet yeah, you ended your comment with like you can't expect you know like a Democratic monolith to come forward and just like you know make this uh, make a carbon price stick and a program stick. What are your concerns on the Democratic side of the ledger? Well, I'm a bit hobbled because the old saying "familiarity breeds contempt" certainly plays out here. I'm pretty <laughs> familiar with the right, so I've got a very jaundiced and hardline view. Uh, uh, a very uh, sometimes unfairly critical. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the left, and so that sort of thing <laughs> hasn't played out as well for me there. Uh, my sense of it in the Democratic side of the aisle is that if you give them the majority uh, in the uh, House and the Senate, and then ask them what their agenda is for climate, they look blankly at you. I don't think there is an agenda. Uh, that said, when we talk to environmental activists, NGOs, uh, and uh, uh, elected uh, officials in the Democratic side of the aisle, which we do as well, uh, it seems as if carbon pricing is generally the default sort of approach. This is, of course, we. this is how we ought to deal with it. It ought to be through carbon pricing. And there's a lot of dispute about what the architecture might look like. Should it be cap and trade? Should it be a carbon tax? If so, how should that tax be structured? How much trade-offs? So there seems to be a lot of debate about the details, but not so much broadly speaking about the policy. My suspicion is that that is likely to hold for a little while. But in an alternative scenario where, say, Donald Trump wins re-election in 2020, which is quite possible, I don't mean to write it off as if this is an unlike, you know, impossible to imagine scenario, uh, under that world, then politics becomes rather different. I could imagine that the window of opportunity for carbon pricing closes as a consequence of Trump's uh, win in 2020. Uh, I wouldn't predict, but I can imagine that occurring with the uh, progressive left and the bulk of the Democratic Party deciding that the carbon budget has nearly disappeared. We don't have time for carbon pricing to do its work. Uh, and so when the Democrats have an opportunity to dictate policy or to influence it going forward, it will be the keep it in the ground agenda. It will be a mandate on uh, uh, Detroit to produce EVs and get rid of internal combustion engines by date certain. Uh, it will be an order for coal fire power plants to shut down with a five-year window to get that done. Uh, a federal RPS, which is quite aggressive, subsidies for renewable energy. I mean, all the command and control policies, which are clumsy, expensive, ham-handed, but attractive to a number of people in the Democratic Party. Okay, we're going to open it up. Please wait for the microphone. State your name and affiliation and question. In the form of a question, we're going to take groups of three. We'll start on this side of the room, these three. Gentlemen over there, two in the middle. Hello, hello, Robert Lanza from ICF. I'd like a comment on the prospects of applying Reggie to the transportation sector and how that might work. Thank you. Example of short question too. Uh, Steve Brock, Center for Climate and Security. Uh, quick question for Jerry on. Uh, a possible sixth way to get a uh, Republican action on this regarding one of their core brand items, national security in support of the Pentagon. Uh, the only uh, issue that the Climate Solutions Caucus has so far succeeded on having consensus on was getting the Pentagon to list the top bases in the NDAA that are subject to uh, climate change threats. We have red mil military readiness issues here in the U.S. due to flooding, fire, et cetera. Do you see that as a, as a potential way um, to get some Republican action on national security? And then my quick question for, uh, for Tom and John, um, agribusiness, there's been a lot of talk lately about soil carbon sequestration. Uh, how do you see incentivizing the tremendous potential for uh, using regenerative ag and other sorts of things to, to draw down climate or to uh, levy some, some costs on, on that part of the industry that continues to admit, much like uh, other sectors? Hi, um, Paolo Cozzi on Unaffiliated. I'm, um, my question is on the revenues of carbon pricing mechanisms. And so uh, John Larson mentioned it uh, briefly, but I was wondering if uh, Thomas Kerr, you could address sort of how the different systems in Colombia, Chile, Mexico, et cetera, are looking at using the carbon prices. And then um, for Jerry and John, there's been, in recent years, interest in kind of a carbon, uh, a revenue neutral carbon tax idea, and that's still alive in some of the subnational efforts, I think, like in the DC uh, 
DC is looking at a carbon fee and rebate program that would essentially give back all the revenues or most of the revenues to citizens. So is there still appetite for that or are we looking at a carbon price in the US that would be going to programs? Thank you. Um, so on, on Reggie and transportation, uh, the, if this was 10 years ago, everybody would be scratching their head saying, how the heck would we actually do this? The, the good news now is that uh, California is, has basically a template for how, wh who would be holding allowances and how they'd be held responsible for the emissions associated with fuels combusted in the transportation sector. So, and now Ontario and, and uh, uh, Quebec do the same thing. So with Reggie, uh, the technical aspects of that question are actually relatively straightforward. You would need to set a cap just like you did for whatever, whatever the level is in each state, and then you would need to, uh, to assign allowance responsibility to, uh, usually it's at what's called the terminal rack. It's where, where those fuels get blended and sent off to the gas stations or, or elsewhere. Um, so that, that's not hard. The harder part is the politics around raising prices for fuels uh, and trying not to get called a gas tax or something like that. Um, now, having said that, this is why I mentioned the Transportation Climate Initiative before, and I'm not trying to say they are explicitly thinking of this option solely right now. They're thinking about all options on the table. But um, one reason why all those states are at the table is because they're running out of revenue for highways and roads because the gas tax is not indexed to inflation and demand is going down. So between those two things, they're running out of money. So uh, a, you know, back to Jerry's national points about revenue and its attractiveness for a variety of different policy goals, uh, that is certainly a factor that could, could drive that discussion in, in the Reggie region or elsewhere. Um, so the technical aspects are there and the politics are tricky but not impossible. Um, on revenue neutrality, I mean, this is related. <laughs> so if you, if you need money for highways and you want to extend your cap to, to transportation, um, that, do you have money for rebates for, for consumers? And the answer is um, that's the politics of carbon pricing. You know, I, I often argue, and I think Jerry touched on a lot, is the, sometimes the harder thing about a carbon price is not whether or not you do it or what the price should be, but what do you do with money? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I think the politics always get tricky. Uh, and so, you know, it is attractive. I have heard the argument that uh, the most attractive way to have a uh, persistent and uh, enduring carbon policy is to give all the money back because then people, the higher the price goes, the bigger the check, right? You know, and that's really attractive. Uh, uh, having said that, there are any number of other purposes that that and any number of interests that will come out of the woodwork to say, this is why I need $5 billion or $10 billion or $50 billion. So, um, so I'll stop there. Tom, since you were asked to address some of the same things, you want to just add on to anything? Yeah, just briefly, um, uh, we, so we looked at this issue of use of revenues. That, uh, we did a, um, a sort of executive brief on use of revenues, all the different jurisdictions and who, what they're doing. And I think there was a complete mix of things. As you say, it's a very political question. Um, the Colombian actually, interestingly, is split between environmental support and the peace process. So they use some of that money for the peace process there to buy the political will. Um, you know, you'd argue from climate, that's not the best thing, but that worked for them. Uh, you know, I think that that's, that, as you say, it has become a political force. Football, um, but I think we ha are seeing. Uh, I think Alberta, um, California, other others are sort of setting aside, to, especially for, and Alberta. I think it was really interesting. It was sort of a, a transition fund for some of the fossil sector, and I think that's one of the few examples I've seen that kind of goes to the heart of that problem around training programs and, and te new tech and trying to get, um, you know, give, give them a bit of an, uh, a, a, some sweetener to, to make that transition um, and use the revenues for emissions reducing activities rather than completely something different. But this briefing kind of goes through it. I think it's called the, you know, the uh, Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition use of uh, carbon pricing revenues. So if you're looking for that, it's kind of a quick and 10 pager that kind of goes through all the jurisdictions and tells you the pros and cons of different approaches. <coughs> security rep. There are a lot of people on the right who spend time and energy promoting the national security arguments for addressing climate change and mobilizing every last uniformed officer they possibly can to make the case for climate action. Uh, and as far as I can tell, it hasn't moved any needles anywhere. And that's largely because you have to understand that for most people on the right, it's not so much that 
the word Earth isn't warming and the, thermostat, uh, the thermostatic data are fraudulent and cooked and, you know, that sort of thing, though episodically you hear those stories. The general narrative is climate is changing. Climate always changes after reluctantly conceding the fact of four seasons. Uh, and that, uh, but, you know, the humans were involved. In other words, we're, the world is warming for no apparent reason. And if you believe that, then to say that, well, you know, we're going to have flooding and sea level rise is going to hurt U.S. bases, like, yeah, maybe, because of the circadas, because of the earth wobble, because of, you know, something. Uh, so we'll address it, but that doesn't necessarily mean we need to have mitigation programs because they don't believe CO2 has much to do with this. And so that's the, that's the fundamental point. And the second point you have to remember is that at least when you're talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the right wing base in, in the United States, uh, Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh uh, and Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram and Alex Jones and Donald Trump and, uh, and, and Steve Bannon and all the people at Breitbart and uh, Red State and what have you have infinitely more persuasive and influential power than does a major, a general, or some, not somebody testifying in front of Congress once every four months uh, about how uh, uh, base, uh, uh, bases are going to have to be uh, upgraded because of sea level rise or what's going to happen with migration because of climate change. It's, it's, it's not even a fair fight. So no, I'm a little bit skeptical on that. Uh, as far as revenue neutrality being the magic key that opens up uh, Republican support, I'm also skeptical about that. Uh, the reality is, is that we really don't know what the right political uh, 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 combination of uh, policies is to unlock conservative support. This is an iterative trial, trying by doing uh, er, uh, exercise. But, you know, the most important thing to remember is that we are in favor, or at least I'm in favor of carbon pricing, I think John's in favor of carbon pricing, uh, and Tom probably is as well, for the simple reason that's the most efficient way to get greenhouse gas emissions reductions, because it harnesses uh, price signals to do the job that otherwise would have to be done clumsily and inefficiently by regulators. It just so happens it produces a ton of revenue. What we do with that revenue is an entirely separate matter, has nothing to do with climate policy. It just has nothing to do with it. And so for climate activists to have strong opinions about how to use that revenue, to me is so utterly counterproductive, whether you're on the left or the right, that it, 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 it's an, it, it should be a conversation stopper. But to have any, comp, any debate that then impedes the ability to get carbon pricing because we can't agree about revenue use is absolutely counterproductive and suicidal. So, while I have preferences about how to use government revenues, I don't like to port them into this. And when we talk to Republicans on Capitol Hill, we are not trying to force an answer. Because after all, they're better political animals than we are. They're the ones who face voters. They have infinitely more political knowledge and data points than I'm ever going to have. They're going to tell me how best to use the revenue. Because they understand full well that the revenue produced by a carbon tax is an asset they have to go find support if the revenue is used in certain optimal, optimal ways. And for me to presume to tell them how to do that is really counterproductive and a bit arrogant. So I try not to do that. We let them take the lead. And to the extent to which they have pointed, you know, given us a lead on this, it is not towards revenue neutrality. Even amongst conservative Republicans that we deal with uh, that, believe it or not, are actively interested in carbon pricing, revenue neutrality is not at all a demand. It's just simply not. Um, Tom has to go, but uh, we'll take one more round of questions really quickly uh, before we close. I think we should have a conference on what to do with the revenues just to just keep, to bother me. Just to keep bothering Jerry a little bit. Uh, okay, we'll do one more round. We've got uh, right there, I promised over here, and right here. But quickly, please. And not four questions each. Sorry, Liam Stone with the Government of Alberta. Um, so we had a bit of an idealized process where we had fossil fuel companies working with Angos who brought a policy framework forward to the government, included a higher price on carbon and a cap on oil sands emissions. Um, Last week at Tom's uh, Carbon Pricing and Leadership Coalition, the question was, how do we bring fossil fuel companies to the table in much the same way? Um, Senator Whitehouse argued that this lawsuits would help bring them forward. Now the issue is, one of the companies that did that in Alberta is now being sued in Boulder. So do you think there's a space for a fossil fuel company to do the right thing and get the credit um, from the other side of this, uh, the other side of this issue. 
Thank you. Um, I wondered, uh, Jerry or John, uh, about the question of uh, nuclear, which accounts for 60 percent of our, almost 60 percent of our carbon-free electricity. H how do you assess the zero emissions approach to this issue and, and the political economy of dealing with this issue, in John, uh, uh, Jerry, in terms of the, the political support of the industry for carbon? Uh, carbon prices uh, that would give them more viability. Thank you. Uh, John Wood with the Energy Blue Project. Just curious if there's any lessons we learned from the recent experience with the 45Q tax credits for carbon capture, which got through Congress in February. An example of the left and the right coming together, a very bipartisan uh, approach. Surprisingly, I don't know that we've had too many pieces of legislation where you have Mitch McConnell, John Barrasso, Sheldon Whitehouse, Cory Booker, Heidi Heitkamp, Joe Manchin, all working together, speaking somewhat, I think, to Mr. Taylor, also that soft landing for certain industries. Uh, but is that, uh, does that give us some hope that uh, there is a way to bring the environmental left and the fossil energy right together here? Secondly, and this may be outside the bounds of this, but I'm just curious about understanding the efficiency and all the great things about carbon pricing. The need, though, for some positive incentives, and there is an implicit price in the 45Q tax credit, but positive incentives to drive technology development to get through the valley of death and overcome the various hurdles that, again, would sort of go along with carbon taxes, uh, cap and trade, et cetera. Sure. Uh, last question first on uh, how best to drive technological development, uh, push or pull. Uh, I once got into hot discussions about this with my friends at the Breakthrough Institute in various panels and with my friend Oren Cass, who is a, uh, a climate uh, skeptic -y kind of guy at the Manhattan Institute, uh, who also makes this argument that a carbon tax uh, is, is not an optimal policy. Uh, they believe in big Manhattan Project R&D uh, initiatives for low carbon energy. Uh, it turns out, though, that if you look at the economics literature, uh, David Pop being one of the leading practitioners in this field, but there are plenty of others, uh, it's, it is screamingly clear that a carbon tax produces far more uh, uh, technological innovation than do subsidies for technological innovation. There are various reasons for that, but on the liter in the literature, uh, all, much of which is uh, summarized in the IPCC reports as well, so it's no secret, uh, carbon pricing is critical. Now, it, it can be complemented with other policies, uh, but it is more a driver than a backstop. Um, as far as the uh, 45Q tax credits, yeah, if you want to subsidize fossil fuels and environments, environmentalists and Democrats want to go along with it, sure, you can pass anything you want. Republicans are all there, right? So, of course, the coal industry is going to like it. I mean, it turns out Bob Murray at uh, Murray Coal didn't like it because it kind of implicitly assumed the, uh, that CO2 uh, emissions are a problem and he didn't want to go there, but he was fairly much alone on that. I mean, even, even in the coal industry, you know, Bob Murray is kind of an outlier. Um, so, yes, if you want to promote uh, 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 subsidies for low carbon technology that are directed at the coal, oil, or gas industry, you have an easier time of it. This is not a heavy lift. On the other hand, the, what you've accomplished is also relatively modest as well. Uh, for various reasons, I don't suspect the 45Q uh, tax credit is going to produce much uh, in the way of uh, emissions reductions. Um, as far as, and I'll let you handle nuclear because that's to it. I wanted to get to the question about uh, uh, bold, the Boulder suit and Suncor. Simply because, well, for uh, truth and advertising, we're serving pro bono for the city of Boulder in that case. So I know a little bit about it. Uh, and it's not uh, that uh, uh, the people we're representing or co-representing in that case have anything uh, particularly out for Suncor uh, uh, as a company. They do, however, do business in Colorado, which puts them in, uh, in uh, Boulder and uh, Sam McGuell's uh, gun sites. But the reality is, is that uh, Greenhouse gas emissions by the industry have imposed costs on municipalities, and you have a choice. Are those adaptation costs going to be paid for by the taxpayers of Boulder or San Miguel, or are they going to be paid for by the manufacturers who caused the, uh, the, uh, uh, the warming adaptation expenditures to be made in the first place? That's something the courts are going to sort out. 
my guess is that it will likely play out that if these suits, like Boulder's, like San Francisco's and Oakland, have legs. In other words, they don't get immediately dismissed and they're played out and we go through discovery uh, and these things go and, and start moving uh, up the food chain in the judicial uh, uh, arena, we will find that settlements and settlement conversations in the legislature are likely. And that's not the reason for the suits, but it's a natural consequence of successful lit lit uh, litigation uh, in this arena. Under those circumstances, I think that can be a very powerful driver uh, for, uh, uh, for carbon pricing because that would probably be one of the legislative prices for a deal. So on nuclear, and I'll touch on 45Q2 to, 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 from a different angle, um, maybe just a higher level point about carbon taxes in relation to technology specific support or issues. One of the tricky things about a carbon tax and that makes it different from other energy policies is that it doesn't call out a particular technology, somebody's favorite thing. And so it, we saw this in Waxman Markey where there were uh, groups on the left that were actually very not, uh, not enthused about a cap and trade program because it didn't mean X number of gigawatts of wind and solar are going to get built, right? You actually don't know how much is going to get built. You just know there's going to be a carbon price and that wind and solar are going to be favored, but we can't tell you what's going to happen. Um, and which is why they added efficiency standards and appliance and renewable portfolio standards and all sorts of other stuff to the bill. Um, separate from the, even though the carbon tax would have likely done the more, more than, than those policies. Um, so with regard to any given technology like nuclear, you have to hope, uh, or at least drive for a price, carbon price, that's gonna be high enough to matter for that particular technology. In, with nuclear, at least to save existing nuclear generators, uh, as opposed to inducing new ones, um, uh, you need at least 30 bucks a ton, looks like, uh, around, around the country, uh, you've, you, and you've actually seen um, basically very narrowly focused carbon prices um, used as a solution to prop up nukes in Illinois, New York, and now in New Jersey. Uh, and I think the price is even higher than that. But I mean, ballpark what we're seeing is minimum 30 bucks a ton. Um, so looking at a future potential federal discussion and thinking about the existing nuclear fleet and the existing nuclear operators, um, you've got at least one constituency that would be shooting for a higher rather than lower price. And any, anything above that is all gravy for them. That's all good, right? It's going to make them whole and, and then some and profitable. Um, 45Q is kind of uh, interesting in that, uh, you know, if we did succeed in a national carbon price and maybe this coalition that supported that uh, could be part of a coalition that supports it, I'm, I'm not quite sure. We'll see, we'll see what the politics look like down the road. But, uh, you, you make 45Q irrelevant, right? Well, if you've got a carbon price that's higher than the incentive in 45Q, right? Because as long as you're shoving a, CO2, a ton of CO2 in the ground and not putting it in the air, you should be getting, if in a well-crafted carbon tax policy um, or cap and trade program, a credit um, for avoiding that ton of CO2. Um, and so you, one would hope at least that that coalition, so long as they're, they don't have other oxes getting gored in the legislative process, would be uh, supportive or at least recognize that the carbon price would act um, in a very similar and maybe even more beneficial way than the current tax credits. But I don't know if that has been socialized by, uh, I don't think that's necessarily recognized yet in that same coalition. But um, so, you know, I mean, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's hard to say to a given technology um, or solution like carbon capture and storage, trust us, the carbon price will give you guys a lot to work with. Um, but in reality, that's really where we need, that, that is the whole idea of an efficient solution to climate, policy, climate change, is, is having that price and letting the economy sort it out. So, you know, it's important not to lose sight of that. Yeah. Um, so we could clearly keep going and talking about this for a long time. Maybe just one observation to close the panel. I do think what's interesting, having done a number of these over the years, is that, you know, carbon pricing, both as a mechanism uh, a, in a concept, has spread. Uh, it's spread to companies, it's spread to banks, it's spread to different localities than originally envisioned, which was sort of a national level linked, you know, system uh, that would create a market that would send this clear and transparent, you know, pricing signals. And it, it's clear that we, we're, we're going into a world where it's a much messier outlook than that for all carbon prices, right? There's a lot of them, a lot of different places. They're not necessarily clear. They're not necessarily transparent. And a lot of them are politically driven rather than market driven, right? And so, but, but I do think that what seems to be happening is that the expectation for what that original vision of a carbon price is supposed to deliver and solve around this carbon uh, and climate issue is just intensifying. 
right? So usually what we'll hear is a question about, well, if we could get a carbon price or a carbon tax that was all of those things, what are all these other issues that we could clear up, right? Would we be able to put the genie back in the bottle in terms of the way that we're approaching regulation or the way that uh, climate has entered the boardroom or it's entered the courtroom? I think that's the biggest open question is whether this kind of expectation for a policy like this uh, is just becoming too much weight for this conversation to bear. Uh, so I don't know, I guess we'll find out. But uh, thank you guys very much for sharing your thoughts. I think you've given everybody a lot to uh, go home and think about as they approach this issue. And uh, we'll do it again in, in the future. So thanks, Tom, for wherever you are. But also thanks to Jerry and to John. And please join me in thanking you.